there's a number of things to say about this. The first is that we're talking about the old French colonies of Africa. You know, at one point, France had almost half the African continent in its control. Um, these are the old French colonies. Many of them won their independence between 1958 and 1961. Um, but they won independence in a constrained way. So, for instance, um, they all continue to use the French franc as the principal currency. All of them said that at least 50 percent of their foreign reserves would be held in the Bank de France, not in their own countries. You know, the French continued to dominate these countries economically. Um, many of them were principal producers of raw materials. And France, French companies continued to dominate them. Like Niger, for instance, is a big producer of, of uranium. France continued to dominate um, the uranium mines in Niger, in Agadez, uh, sorry, in, in Arlit from the 1960s till the present. Um, so French dominion continued. This was, there was always pushes and strains and tugs against um, France's role. But there was something that in a way broke the, um, you know, the straw that broke the camel's back was two events in 2011. One was the, the way in which France militarily intervened in Côte d'Ivoire to intervene in an election result. Um, by stopping a president from taking office. France intervened militarily. This created a lot of anger in many parts of, of formerly Francophone Africa, you know, in so-called Franc Afrique. A lot of places people are upset by what happened in Côte d'Ivoire, and it's not been forgotten. When you talk to political people across uh, what had been French Africa, whether even in Gabon, you know, people said the intervention of France, there was super unjustified, illegal and so on, even though it was backed to some vague extent by the UN. Second event in 2011 w took place in Libya when France led the way to destroy the Libyan state in NATO's war. These are two 2011 events, which were the straws that broke the camel's back. Um, after the French invaded with the British, uh, Americans um, bombed the living daylights out of Libya, um, many of the jihadis who France and uh, United States had brought from Syria and Turkey into Libya, these are people from the Libyan Islamic fighting group who had left Libya in the 1990s, gone into Afghanistan and so on. The West brought them back as the shock troops against Gaddafi. Many of these fellows went into southern Algeria, joined up with Al-Qaeda groups, and then went south into Mali, into Burkina Faso, all the way into northern Nigeria. You know, they made immense gains. France then, terrified by the Pandora's box that it had not only opened but created, built, uh, intervened through Operation Barkhane into Mali in 2013, and then into Burkina Faso and Niger 2015. Um, there's an enormous U.S. military base in Agadez, Niger, the largest drone base in the world. So the West intervenes in this region, so-called to confront the jihadi threat. But in fact, also it was to deal with the migrants who were going north into Europe. I mean, the, the Europeans built a border in the Sahel region. The French called it G5 Sahel, you know, with European Union funding. European Union, in fact, funded the use of artificial intelligence surveillance technology in Niger, which is banned in Europe. You know, it's a real scandal, um, but things like that were being done. OK, now in this part of the world, left political forces uh, had been rather destroyed during the neoliberal period. You know, when the IMF came in and impoverished these countries, the left continued in trade unions, peasant organizations and so on. But in terms of party political dynamics, many of them had been defanged, you know, or, or People had been killed, sent into exile, you know, not able to function. So when the political catastrophe of this post-NATO war in Libya germinated, um, in many of these countries, the only political force available for young, particularly men who were there in uh, from rural areas, petty bourgeois backgrounds, was the military. Um, you know, it was clear that they were going, there was going to be action. Now, it has to be said that a lot of young people have been taking the streets in Ouagadougou, um, in, in, you know, in, in Burkina Faso, in Bamako, in Mali, and in Tumbuktu, North Mali. A lot of mass demonstrations of young people, but no political formation for them that could have acted against uh, French military occupation of their countries. So the military conducts these coups, two in Mali, two in Burkina Faso, one in Guinea, 
one in Niger and then now in Gabon. Gabon is slightly different. I'll come to that. So the military comes to power. But, you know, in all these countries, they quickly, you know, created a civilian administration. Um, in, in all of them, there's a civilian government as well. And interestingly, like Asima Goite in, in, in Burkina Faso and Mali, the two governments of Mali, Burkina, they fashion themselves as the children of Thomas Sankara. You know, they even dress and talk like him. So this is the way. ECOVAS, over the course of the last 15 years or so, has it's an economic block, okay? They've created this peacekeeping force. It's not really the origin of ECOWAS. And they have worked with the West in intervening here, there, and everywhere. So when the coups took place, particularly in Niger, see, Niger was the threat because Niger is the source of French um, nuclear power industry. That's where the uranium comes from. Large drone base by the Yanks. They said, we got to stop this dynamic, this coups, you know, Guinea, Burkina Faso, Mali. God, Niger is the place we're going to have the draw the line. Can't happen. So there was a threat for ECOWAS troops to enter Niger. Now, a couple of things happened. One, in Niger, there was mass demonstrations against military intervention. That means whoever intervenes is going to deal with a civil uprising, you know, on their hands. Secondly, Mali and Burkina Faso made statements saying, if you attack Niger, we will enter and we will attack you. And now they've in fact created a grouping, AES, the grouping of Sahelian states, which, you know, is basically a security pact. They just signed this agreement. Um, okay, then the generals from Nigeria, Ghana and all met in ECOWAS's military committee. And I think they, because right after that, the temperature went down. They basically said, I'm not putting my troops on the ground in Niger. And that was over. Now, why ECOWAS? Why didn't France intervene directly? The, we know what's been going on. In Mozambique, a couple of years ago, I've written a series of stories. I went to Cabo Delgado, northern Mozambique, where Total, Fr French company, and Exxon Mobil have a big natural gas platform offshore. It's the poorest area of Mozambique. There was an uprising there against the French and, and, and US um, natural gas platform, big uprising. The Mozambique military couldn't put down the uprising. The police couldn't handle it. Um, so the French made a deal with Paul Kagame's Rwanda to send Rwandan troops, thousand of them into northern Cabo Delgado, where they used all kinds of methods. There's no oversight. I mean, I don't know what human rights method. Where is you know, Madam Beerbock, when it comes to Rwanda's intervention in Cabo Delgado, that was an illegal intervention. Okay, so in a way, France, United States, they want to Rwandanize these conflicts. They want African troops to deal with it, ECOWAS instead of Rwanda and Niger. But the generals from Ghana, Nigeria, they were like, I don't think so. So we're in an interesting position. Gabon is different. Gabon is a little bit like Haiti. Uh, in that the Bongo family has ruled in Gabon, um, you know, for 60 plus years. You know, Omar Bongo took power in the 60s. I mean, for 60 years, they've been leeching that rich country and keeping it in abject poverty. This was an uprising against the Bongo family. You know, this is not really an uprising against France per se. It's not as anti-French. This is against the Bongo family. The Bongo family are gone just as the Duvaliers were removed from Haiti. There's a new government, opposition leader is now in power in Bongo, but in, in Gabon. But it's unlikely that in Gabon, this government is going to be able to set a good agenda. Uh, so it might radicalize things further. But, you know, there were protests in Benin recently, another form of French colony. Um, there were, um, there's been the stirrings of demonstrations in, in Sierra Leone, in, uh, in Senegal and so on. I don't know what's going to happen, but certainly France, a mediocre country, is being booted out of Africa. I can say that much. This podcast was brought to you by BG Media App and BarGlobal.net. Please subscribe, like, and share this video. It does help support our productions. Also, please download the BG Media App to access the best works of the world's authors rendered in audiobooks, along with great experience through music, podcasts, and vodcasts. Thank you.